So as we look at the concept here of forging a new nation, we address the beginning and the end of the Constitution and being in parentheses because the Bill of Rights wasn't added until after President Washington was sworn in. And we also look at the goals that Washington is going to eventually seek to accomplish. So those are kind of our dual tasks when we forge this new nation. Now recall that the preamble is the beginning. We the people, the first three words, power of the government comes from the people. That's ultimately where it lies. And when you look at this preamble, it's kind of like a contract with the federal government. Yes, we will follow the rules, follow the laws. What do we get in return? What's our end of the bargain? We do expect the defense of justice and liberty. Absolutely 100% justice and liberty. We expect peace and stability. When we go to sleep at night, we'll wake up to the same system that we've known our entire lives. That's a simple expectation that we as Americans have. And we also want protection. If anyone tries to invade, that can be a physical military invasion, or even in the 21st century, like an online cyber invasion. We expect to be kept safe. So that's where the preamble sets things up. Remember that with the Bill of Rights, this was the big thing that anti-federalists wanted. And Patrick Henry even took the Virginia Ratifying Convention and turned it more into a Bill of Rights debate. Why aren't there a Bill of Rights? How come it's not present in the Constitution? We need it. Madison and Washington felt that the document was clear enough that there wasn't a need for a Bill of Rights. And when you see here, most states already had clearly spelled out bills of rights. So that's another reason why it wasn't necessarily a pressing need in Philadelphia. But Federalists said, give us the Constitution. We'll give you the Bill of Rights. So that's kind of where it stood. Amusingly enough, James Madison is not only the father of the Constitution, but he's the father of the Bill of Rights. He was the majority writer on the 12 proposed amendments that would have been a part of this Bill of Rights. Now, of the 12, 10 were approved by the states and became part of the Bill of Rights. Now, of course, the question becomes, what were the two? What was left out? One would have actually provided limits on how many constituents a representative could serve. Madison originally wanted to keep legislative districts small so they legitimately could be able to listen to the concerns of their citizens. If that amendment had been ratified, you know, today there are a total of you know, over 500 members of Congress. There's 100 senators, 535, uh, 435 voting members, three more that don't have a vote, so 538 total members. There'd be about 6,000 members of Congress today if this had passed. So that, that would have been a whole other issue to try and resolve. The other proposed amendment that didn't make it actually became the 27th Amendment. And it stated that any congressional pay raises would not take effect until the next session of Congress. So it was proposed in 1789. It was ratified in 1992. So it only took about, uh, what, 203 years, but better late than never. All of the Bill of Rights, there's some that aren't necessarily as well known, and normally the, that's the last two. You see, Amendments 1 through 8, you know, the freedoms in the First Amendment, right to bear arms, quartering of troops, search and seizure, right to remain silent, trial by jury, cruel and unusual punishment. Those first eight protect the rights of individual citizens. It protects the rights of the people. 
The last two are designed to limit the powers of the new national government. By the wording of these amendments, you know, when you simplify it, if there's something in the Constitution or something not in the Constitution that Congress is supposed to deal with, the states are supposed to get that right. So this is kind of the simplified version of the Bill of Rights. We get this settled, we can forge ahead. Now, Washington is unanimously elected president. That's, that was really no surprise. It was kind of a foregone conclusion that he would be our first commander in chief. He has to do everything from scratch. Step one, he needs advisors. He needs individuals who he can trust, but are also talented. He needs to build what we now call a cabinet, the core advisors that are experts in their chosen field. So he needs a cabinet to run various parts of the government. There's a couple of financial issues that we need to deal with. There's still leftover debt from the revolution. There's also a proposal for what we call the Bank of the United States. Can we do it? Is it legal? These are some of the central issues that he'll have to confront. Funding the government, getting income will be an issue. It'll be something that we have to decide, do we want to do this? That's where the excise tax comes into play, an excise tax is simply a tax on a specific good. Like today, there's a gasoline tax. That's an excise tax. And we need to deal with other nations. We say foreign nations, like Britain and France, because they're on the other side of the ocean. Domestic deals with issues at home. Spain is a presence in North America. We'll have to deal with them. There are numerous Native American tribes that are surrounded by land called the United States. Those are going to be nations that need to be negotiated with. So with our reminder of what the Constitution and the Bill of Rights stand for, Washington is going to begin to forge ahead and essentially create a presidency that will lead his young nation.